Hello, I'm Barman Williams, and we're back with a small print. And today, my guest is Pizza Bruce. And always on this show, we asked our guests to introduce themselves the way they would like to be introduced. So, Pizza, please tell us a bit uh, about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, well, um, I am a South African born. I grew up here. I went to school and born and grew up in Amtata in Transkei. Um, I've been a journalist for around about 45 years. I'm a former um, news editor on the Financial Times, uh, was the editor of Business Day and Business Report, Financial Mail. Um, and I'm now in a quite a hardworking semi-retirement uh, in the Western Cape, um, and uh, yeah, you know, trying to live my best life as as you get more mature, uh, and very happy, very happy to be talking to you. Very happy to be in this country at this time. It's a very exciting place, never boring, as you know, I'm sure, um, and very challenging, you know, intellectually and 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 emotionally sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. The interesting times thing is correct globally yeah. at the moment. I mean, we, we're recording this conversation as news of the war in Ukraine is broken out, which is only going to impact everything. And at the same time, in South Africa in particular, we've always been a particularly interesting place to live, interesting in all senses of the word. Yeah. And yeah. You know, what we really wanted to get into with you today, so I know you've written about the subjects over, over many years, actually, is what we're actually facing right now, and I think that this is quite a global macro challenge that can be unpacked in various different ways. We are seeming yeah. to be shifting from the politics of abundance and growth at all costs and all of those good things into much more the politics of scarcity. When we're starting to talk about scarcity, we can talk about things like inflation and stagflation and declining wage productivity and all that sort of thing, but also on a very literal sense, there's also the, the movement towards degrowth and sustainability and the sustainable energy transition, which obviously has different trade-offs and payoffs for different countries across the world. And these sorts of macro trends are converging in South Africa at a particularly interesting time in our already very interesting history and are going to have a lot of implications for the electorate, for politicians, for policy, and for all of those things going forward. So could I get a bit of your view on how you see, in a, in a nutshell, at a high-level perspective, the big challenges ahead with the move to global degrowth, and in particular, the clean energy transition? Yeah. Look, I'm, I don't have your gift for encompassment. Um, uh, uh, so if my answer... That's why I invited be, you, <laughs> to um, actually break it down. <laughs> let, me, let me try. You know, I think we need to start back in the early 90s, 1994, perhaps from our point where we became a democracy, the uh, the ruling party, the ANC, was clearly unprepared for government. Um, it really hadn't uh, taken care in exile or at home to understand the complexities of running a fairly modern economy um, with, with apartheid's particularly toxic history. In other words, a lot of people sort of left behind, out of the picture, poor, no hope, no education, no health. Uh, and they, they had sort of intellectual ideas and ideologies about how this might end up being resolved. But putting it into practice has proven to be uh, too much for them. And so South Africa is a very, in a very weak condition at the moment. Um, we, are, we, owe the, we owe the rest of the world and, and our financial institutions an enormous amount of money. Um, so we're trying to imagine, you try and reduce South Africa to a household. You're basically in debt. The bank manager's on the phone all the time. Uh, your kids still need to go to school. You're still going to put food on the table. Um, and you are, you know, while you're trying to look calm uh, when you, you know, uh, appear on a screen uh, below, you know, you, you, you're treading water like crazy. Um, and... So, we're, we're, you know, the world is, is changing and becoming more complex. Um, and South Africa, instead of keeping up with that, is desperately just trying to survive every mo from moment to moment. Um, and it's very sad and it's disappointing. It didn't have to be like this, but, you know, I guess that uh, countries and societies have a learning curve that's inescapable. We all have to go through everything before we, before we come right. The, the, the energy story, which in, in a way is, is, is it's an interesting uh, sort of marker to put up there because it's the be all and end all 
of, of how we can measure ourselves. Um, because it's all about how we, you know, energy has two core um, uh, storylines, I suppose. One is the actual energy and the power and the lights and the and driving machinery. The other one is just food, you know, how we, how we eat and what we eat, how it's grown. I was reading a, a, a wonderful new book the other day uh, on climate change. Um, and the figure that st stuck with me was that every year, climate change is, is taking out of our food chain, as the world's population increases, taking out of our food chain about 35 trillion calories, um, which is just a measure of sort of food energy, I suppose. Um, but we are, we are, in a way, as a world and as a country, because climate change is happening much more quickly in South Africa. We are warming at double the rate of the rest of the world in Southern Africa. We may not know it. You may not think it to listen to the government and its ministers. Um, but, you know, our, our ability to feed ourselves is, is at risk. Something else that the government hasn't dealt with um, or, hasn't, or has dealt with and has dealt with very badly. Um, so the way land is allocated and owned and used is... Is, 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 you know, we're having the most basic kind of conversations about it, whereas we should be having a much more complex and technical, technically um, intense conversation about land and, and the way we use it. Anyway, so we are, uh, I, I suppose, overarching. We are, at the moment, barely up to the task of being in the year 2022. Um, uh, other societies are maybe coping worse than us, but that's not our concern at the moment. Um, others are manifestly coping better. You know, they've, they've sorted out their politics, they've sorted out their histories, they are interested in technical change, they're mastering technology, um, they're investing in it, and we, we are not. We're desperately still trying to sweep up behind us as we go, because we didn't do it properly the first time we swept. And so we are a, we're not quite a bigger nation yet, but you know, we've knocked very um, heavily on the doors of the international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, New Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Europeans, everybody's lending us money. It's, it's not all that well publicized. It's not, it's not a secret, but nobody's actually done the numbers yet, but it's becoming an increasingly big amount of money. And it's only happening because we've run out of, uh, you know, our debt is no longer credible. We've, we've pushed the local debt markets to the point where if they continue lending to the state, they'll have nothing to lend to the private sector, which is supposed to create all the jobs. Um, and the last resort is the last resort. You know, the IMF and the World Bank is where we now borrow our money. So it's a kind of, I think it's quite a, um, a telling point to stop this rambling introduction of mine. We are, we are now knocking on the World Bank's door, and um, that's not an entirely, even though the money might be cheap and they are, the World Bank and the IMF officials and staff are very sympathetic and all that, you don't want to be there, but unfortunately we are. Let's unpack that a bit. Like, why are we knocking on the door of the IMF? What do we need the money for right now? And let's let's unpack that a little bit in, in, in multiple directions, because there's what we're going to spend the money on, which might not be actually what we need it for. But what are the things that we actually need the cash for? Because we do. We don't have enough capital to meet our bills and to pay all of our entitlements and make good on all the promises we've made to people. But that even can be sort of stripped back and said that that's still not core necessity. There are other expenses that are required to, in much more literal sense, sort of keep the lights on. So maybe you yeah. can unpack that for us. What is the money supposed to be for? What do we actually need cash for? We might have to go get those loans because we've run out of road in other directions. And yeah. what is it more likely to actually be spent on? And then what does that picture mean as we move further yeah. forward? So, so it's you know it's you can never say what the money is going to be spent on what is it all goes in the same pot <laughs> well it doesn't really so what does what is interesting is that normally when these when these um institutions lend money uh certainly the latest let's take one example so we've just negotiated a 750 million dollar loan from the world bank that money when it comes through will be deposited with the um reserve bank it'll go into our foreign exchange reserves 
the, the trickle down from that obviously um, is harder to, to follow. The money basically is going to be used to, um, uh, it, it's overall it's called sort of budgetary support, but it'll be used mainly, I suspect, for what we've come to know or call the just energy transition. Every, you know, every time ESCOM closes down a plant or, or decommissions a power station, um, it's going to require an enormous amount of money. So uh, we now, uh, I think we're going to go to the World Bank again and ask for about another $250 million to close down the first of our promised decommission station, which is Kamati um, in Mpumalanga. Uh, and that's got to be closed by October this year. Done, finished history. Um, whether it gets repurposed to gas or not depends on how the gas debate goes in South Africa. It's not, it's not finished. It hasn't even really started yet. Um, but but the, the, the just energy transition is, the, the point about energy is that it doesn't mean that we are determined to be powered by clean energy at all costs. It means that we understand that unless we do clean up our energy, nobody will buy the things that we make. So yeah, the green lining yeah. is a real thing, right? So if you're not Absolutely. complying with European energy standards, you're cut out of the global financial Absolutely. loan so we've system, got big, right? We've got big, we've got our biggest export earning industry is motor cars. Technically, technically very sophisticated, brings huge skill, retains huge skill in the country. Um, foreign owned, of course. Um, but those cars will not be allowed into Europe or any other country, uh, any other advanced country, uh, unless the carbon footprint they leave behind is appropriate. And we are nowhere near that yet. So the, 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 there's a real urgency now, and uh, urgent in, in terms of you know lots of years, but nonetheless, um, if you're in England now and you're buying a C-Class Mercedes, it might very well be made in East London. Um, uh, but if you're buying it in, say, September, uh, you're going to make different kinds of decisions because in 2030, you, you were in the UK, you will not be able to buy a, a petrol-driven car or a diesel car. Uh, it'll simply be not allowed. And so that's, you know, that's a, that's a kind of um, uh, stake in the ground, I suppose. But generally, we are going to be put under the most enormous pressure on 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 our carbon footprint um, and it's going to cost an enormous amount of money to get from where we are now to a low carbon footprint and somebody's going to have to pay that bill and we don't have the money so it's going to have to be international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank there's no other place to go until we or unless we are able to improve our sovereign debt to the point where we become investable again. And that's much easier said than done. So best case scenario, Peter, how do you, what would, if, if everything aligns and the money was all allocated to the right places, what's the best case scenario we're looking at? How long is this transition period going to play out for? And how much is it going to cost, really? I know it's going to cost fortunes, but, but yeah. like how many generations are going to be paying for this is, is really the question. Yeah. Because this is the, the scarce future as opposed to the abundant future. And, it, and managing those expectations, I think, yeah. critical to, to managing yeah, investor I'm expectations not... and, and, and citizens' expectations and all of that. Yeah. Look, I, the honest answer is I don't know the answer to either of those questions. But, but um, you know, it's, it's obviously multiple generations because what we have now, uh, the plans we have in place now get us to 2030. Uh, we're supposed to be carbon um, uh, free by 2050 or carbon negative by 2030, 2050. Oh. And, you know, in, in three years time, 2025, 2050 will only be, you know, around the corner. Um, by the time we get to 2030, I mean, if we haven't got all of these things in place, we'll never make that target. Um, and I think the world is going to become a, a lot more harsh uh, than it already is. As you say, you know, we have the Russians invading Ukraine because they don't feel safe uh, this morning. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's nationalism all over the world and particularly in Western Europe, we see it now in Russia, China as well. 
Yeah, too. We just had a conversation on the show about how we all of our politics and almost all of our political yeah. parties have taken a turn towards yeah. the more nationalism. Nationalism is not pretty wherever it shows its face, you know. And and mm. uh, it was here with us during apartheid. Unfortunately, we just swapped, you know, um, a, a, a white nationalist government for a black nationalist government. They're equally poor at making decisions. You know, the apartheid government gets a lot of credit for creating ESCOM and Transnet and all these wonderful things, but. And, and there are a lot of people in the ANC who want to recreate it and do what they did, but they don't appreciate that the conditions under which the apartheid government did that are just simply non-repeatable here. It was built on cheap labor, cheap black labor, and that doesn't it exist. It was a theft. It was, it, was, it was a heist, right? It's not, yeah, it's not a real it's plan. Not it's not replicable. Complete, complete fraud. And so we could have cheap electricity because the poor people who were digging the coal out of the ground and shoveling it into... Uh, generators or boilers in uh, in ESCOM power stations weren't paid anything. They were the externalized as costs were not were not accounted for, which yeah. is pretty much the same thing with the whole decarbonization equation, right? We're trying to now account for the real costs and the externalities of our very yeah. comfortable behavior. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive. So I think you know we're looking at many generations ahead of us. I will be uh not around uh, you know i mean i don't know i'm almost 70 now so it you know 20 years i'd be very happy for um uh, i'd love to see 2050 to see whether we make the target or not but um uh yeah look people would it'll take a long time to pay this kind of money back uh, the world and also don't underestimate the extent to which the world will change uh, we see it happening this morning as we're talking in the ukraine where um uh, Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, has uh, basically told the rest of the world to go and get stuffed. Um, he's going to take what he wants. And it'll be so interesting to see how the West particularly responds, because his calculation will be that he doesn't care how the West responds. He's basically um, gotten rid of all the, uh, uh, the US debt that he used to own. Um, and he, his bet will be, they yeah, can put whatever sanctions they want on me. I still got China and Asia and Africa uh, to live my life in and to do our, our business with. Russia is not a very sophisticated economy anyway. Uh, it doesn't make anything anybody particularly wants to buy other than guns and weapons um, and airplanes. Um, uh, and, and the West is, you know, the West is poorly led. Joe Biden is a weak president. He probably won't, you know, he won't be in office uh, after the next election. There are all sorts of reasons to be to be alarmed. It's very hard to be a sort of liberal in the world right now because things aren't necessarily going one's way. But you know how this ends in South Africa is is what is what concerns us, and we we simply can't know. We are making it up literally every day as we go along. You can see it in the many plans that come out. You know, there's just been a, 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 a big study. Uh, published by the NBI on, on, on gas in South Africa, the future of gas. I'm not sure whether you've seen it. Um, and, and they make a specific choice in there where they say um, that gas will need to be used as a transition fuel in the transition from coal-fired energy to, to um, renewable energy. Europe's and the figuring this is, out too, right? I mean, like they've also had some, like, now they're also talking about even rationing their electricity grids and paying people not to use electricity. And uh, they have, they're now like readjusting their plans to say that natural gas can be a part of the green energy transition because yeah. a hard stop the way our grids are set up and the way our economies work. It's just uh, the, the costs are almost too much to bear for the current generation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is it is extraordinary. So you know, and they and so what they are suggesting is, you know, that they somehow there'll be three or four ports where you know gas filled tankers will come and offload rather than you know not the car power ship model, which seems to thank goodness have been um, uh, uh, killed off by court action, um, but you know, but they see they see gas as this necessary thing. So we would need to build quite an expensive and big gas infrastructure. Um, obviously, in which you know investments and uh, will be made and profits uh, are are around and about, um, and and you know we don't know beyond we simply don't know from one day to the next what our energy future is going to look like. So the NBI has a plan. Guerra Mantasha has a he might have a, a plan, but it's written down. It's the 
uh, integrated resource plan, which is very clear, almost no gas at all. But when he speaks, he speaks only about gas. So he clearly wants to use more gas. So we don't know how all this resolves. Um, everybody, everything is up in there until it isn't, you know, and, um, and so it's, it's right to be, it's not wrong to be confused about what's going on in South Africa, because literally nobody knows. I mean, there might be a few experts around who follow these things, but they still don't know what the final decision is going to be. They still don't know who, you know, what the pressure points are. The pressure points for the government are affordability and the size of its debt. Uh, and those pressure points are pushing away from a rapid green energy and transition and actually into doubling down on the, the mess that we have currently, correct? There's not much well, political yeah. incentive to accelerate you know, an expensive energy transition right now, or is there? Is this an issue that the no, electorate cares about? I mean, you know, what you, could, what you could do is simply decide to, um, to forget about gas entirely, forget about the transition in the sense that if you go all out, for solar or renewable energy now, betting on, this, betting on the likelihood that in five to 10 years time, battery development will be sufficiently sophisticated to allow for, to allow for sufficient storage, you would end up having made the better bet. Um, but you know, and what, what people want to see is the technology actually working before they buy into it. So, you know, the battery storage uh, argument doesn't wash with, um, uh, doesn't wash in South Africa because the batteries aren't there yet. They're not good enough yet. They can't, they can't replace, you know, a full, fully fledged six pack power station. Um, and while that may be a silly point of view to have, it, the fact is that it prevails in South Africa and, um, uh, you know, you can't, force, you can't force the government to pay for things that it doesn't want to buy. The, 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 the fact that, you know, a lot of people would be, would be left without livelihoods in the coal-related industry, burning it, digging it out, or transporting it, is a real problem. Um, but, you know, you, you, what you need to do is to try to establish a little part of your government that thinks seriously about what the future of the country might look like. Um, and try to imagine, you know, a, a, a country that, that isn't scared of the world or isn't scared of what's happening and is bold and much more um, a, a confident about its place in the world. We don't export enough, we sure we sell our, um, our minerals, we dig them out the ground, process them a little bit and, and sell them. And it's not, a, not the case that we can't make anything with them. But you have, you know, what the government tries to do is to make decisions about well, we must, you know, we must uh, beneficiate all of our minerals without knowing what the market for the products that result from them might look like when they try and sell them. And so it's a, it's a, it's a sort of silly place we're in. We are, um, we're a viable country, you know, we're a viable society. Um, poorly, poorly, poorly led. Tourism is a great example. I mean, somebody was talking to me this morning about just how badly we have let our tourism sector down. I mean, the Australians, for instance, have been locked down much more harshly for much longer than we have. They are now going full out to open the country again. They've got big budgets behind it. They're advertising, they're marketing across uh, uh, around the world. We don't even, South African tourism, I think doesn't have a CEO at the moment or, or a chief operating officer. There's nobody there, there's nobody thinking about tourism. You can't ask the ministers to think about it because they've got other preoccupations. They want to be, you know, they, they're doing what politicians do. So we haven't got this, we don't have the structures to take advantage of our natural gifts. You know, tourism is, a is just a no-brainer. Um, minerals is a no-brainer. Our sun, our, pot our potential as a source of energy is staggering. We, we, I cannot understand why we do not just build, you know, wind farm upon wind farm and solar farm upon solar farm. The battery storage will come. It'll be there. You know, by the time we get to 2030, batteries will just be, they'll probably even be solid state. It'll be fantastic. And, you know, what storage we need and don't, aren't able to meet with batteries, we can do with water um, and, and hydro storage. It's not difficult. Yet. All we need, our problem is not storage so much as it is peaking. 
Um, and we've got the capacity to deal with that as well. It's not a big deal, but we, you know, everything that, every decision the government makes is political. You have to, you know, it, it will not move unless the base is somehow looked after. And you can, that's, the, all parties are the same. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not unique. Absolutely, not, not unique there. Politicians are politicians and their incentives are slightly differently yeah. aligned to ours. So yeah. it does seem like we are in a bit of a catch there. Obviously, there, there are tight budget constraints everywhere and there are growing entitlements on every area of society. Because when you're talking about the what the electorate needs, they're wanting their basic needs met. They need cheap fuel, they need cheap transport, cheap energy, cheap food too. And increasing the price of energy even marginally already on a base of having many years of electricity price increases and all the rest of it is not going to be a politically easy position to sell to the electorate for the greater good of the future. So that does get one thinking that perhaps this is an area where the private sector is going to have to take a lead because what the story that you've painted is really a story of opportunity. When you start to talk about the renewable energy space, it is a, it is a highly investable area. It could be funded by actual investors looking to invest in something or not. Where do you see the private sector fitting in with this picture? And do you think that optimistic entrepreneurs could end up solving problems that really should be solved by government, but can't because of the the constraints of the sort of political straitjacket that politicians have placed themselves in. Well, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I th obviously, in in any functioning economy, you know, there has to be a place for enterprise and entrepreneurs and 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 a leading place. I mean, you know, top table stuff. We are not an entrepreneurial society. We're a big business economy. Um, uh, and you know the old the Nats and during the apartheid days recognised that perfectly when they built, you know when they built uh, uh, Transnet whatever it was called in those days when they built Escom and, and Isco, um, the whole idea was import substitution where you know we we can we can stand on our own kind of a thing. So we on we've never really tried to be part of the rest of the world. We have no networks, you know, of any economic uh, consequence. We've got political networks, I'm sure. Um, but we we are not able to to join conversations on say energy or whatever or or, or nutrition or or anything really we're just not there in the world um, and because the 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 ANC has really the same um, trigger instinct as the as the Nats which is to let's make sure we're okay let's make sure you know nobody can hold us to ransom so let's make everything ourselves you can see it now in localization, which is just, you know, stupid, really. And um, uh, so while they're doing that, other countries are doing the most amazing things, you know, other entrepreneurs in other countries are, um, are creating meat out of plants or or meat out of the carbon of, in the air, even like you can suck the carbon yeah. out of the atmosphere now and turn it into the proteins in required Austin, to grow lab grown meat. <laughs> yeah, no, in Iceland, you can now make they're now making briquettes out of carbon for God's sakes and burying them, you know, under the under in 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 the rock. Um, there is so much, there's so much technological um, innovation going on around the world, and we are not part of any of those conversations. We look around us and say, ah, let's try that, let's try that. But we don't join it, you know, um, and it's it's we, we so we're constantly missing the boat. The big new thing in South Africa, as I'm sure you know, is hydrogen, right? So green hydrogen is now the cure for everything. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna basically, and it's a lovely idea because green hydrogen as fuel, its emission is is water. Um, so nobody, you know, you don't. There is literally nothing to worry about. But other countries are there already, you know, and. Um, we will try to become, um, there's an instinct in South Africa to try to, to try to almost corner the market in the things that we think that we own. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a very silly idea. Um, the world has no time for that kind of thinking and uh, or behavior. Um, and it's, and it's, yeah, you know, we just, we are unable to think our way out of this thing. So yes, there should be room for entrepreneurs, but nobody's encouraging enterprise in this country. What Ibrahim Patel is trying to do is crowd everybody in 
to localization. He didn't want people going off and, and doing things on their own and, and exporting. Um, you know, if, we wanted, if you wanted to encourage exporters like the Indians do, you wouldn't tax the profits that people make exporting. I mean, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a pharmaceuticals company in India and you're selling um, uh, your, your product in South Africa, you don't get taxed on the profits you make in South Africa. It's all yours. So you, you make more. You know, you, you hire more people to, to, to make what you do. Um, in South Africa, if, if um, Adcock or, or any of our uh, drugs companies sells abroad, they get taxed on the profits they make abroad. So they can't compete with anybody. They might as well not bother, you know, and it's really a shame. We are unable to think, we're unable to think like entrepreneurs and as a result, we have very few entrepreneurs worth talking about. They leave, they go to America like Elon Musk or others um, because they can flourish in those environments and they can't flourish here. We are, we are a very small kind of um, defensive conservative society. Um, and we, 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 you know, we, we look um, uh, warily at people who are different and do things differently and, and get wildly excited about things. We try and bring them down. It's a very sad way to look at things, but I suppose part of yeah, that picture right. is the monopoly part of the, the story, right? In that there, there's still huge regulation around the energy industry here that is preventing private sector players from participating at all. We still have state-owned monopolies and huge constraints, even down to sort of talking about things like taxing private homes for running generators during load shedding. So the, the government has not only not provided a attractive environment for entrepreneurship, it's actively hostile towards private sector solutions in the space. Do you see that changing or are they likely to no. double down on that going forward? No, it won't change. Not while the ANC is in power. The ANC grew up in a hostile, you know, in a hostile relationship with business because business would seem to be part of the system that oppressed black people. And it was. There's no getting away from it. It just was. What they don't see now is how that same um, sector, that same business, that same activity of creating value and profit can be used to their benefit. They see it as something that you can tax, but they don't see it as something that you can ride into the sunset on that can save the country. You know, they, they, it is just something to be tolerated and taxed um, and, and not encouraged to get above its get above itself. So don't start an airline, don't start a, a new railway company, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, people do. Um, uh, and the regulations, you know, until they make it impossible, um, will tend to be will tend to be broken because people need to make living, you know, people, people naturally want to, the whole point of investing is to, to live better, you know, to try and try your luck, whether it's whether you're investing in you know, in an ice cream business that Cyril Ramaphosa was talking about the other day in his State of the Nation yeah. address, or whether you're, nice. whether you're starting a new airline, um, the drive is the same thing, you know, how can, I, how can I create more value so that I can extract some of that for myself and my family? And, um, uh, you know, the, the more money you have access to, the more value you can create because these things cost a lot sometimes. But, you know, the fellow who started an ice cream business um, is, is it comes from exactly the same uh, impulse as somebody who does something bigger. So it's in South Africans, but it's been suppressed for a long time. And what you know would be really nice would be to see a government um, that took it seriously and tried to encourage it. You can tell by the makeup of, of Sir Ramaphosa's cabinet and all of the ANC cabinets and all of the the, 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 the National Party cabinets before it. Nobody was ever there to encourage um, risk uh, and adventurism in, in business. We've, we are, we've always been a, uh, an anxious country. Uh, and you can understand how, you know, the first white people who arrived here were anxious. They'd be, you know, they, the first 10 generations of South, white South Africans probably didn't, didn't sleep with their eyes closed. You know, they, it was, it was, they were, it was uh, the notion, the simple fact of being here 
was a, a rocky thing because we were clearly um, uh, trumping on people who were already here. And I'm not talking just about black and white, but there were indigenous people in South Africa when, you know, when, uh, when Jan van Riebeck or all these people uh, first got here. So the, we've, it's always been a precarious thing to build, a, to build this kind of nation um, and to build it into a kind of unified economic entity. Um, it's, it's precarious and it continues to be. I mean, we've never, we've never settled. We're not Australia, we're not New Zealand. We're still on edge. Um, and while we are on edge, nothing good will come because, because people need to, people don't have that kind of confidence. People there's make not a their sense money. of shared value. There's not, there's a sense still of winners and losers, right? And unless you can have that sense of shared value that's I, I, believed, then of course people are going to act self-interestingly. Yeah. Look, I think it's interesting because, because particularly in a stress, a very highly stressed moment like we are now, or last year in say June when there was all that violence, you kind of look to the rest of the country, um, out of KwaZulu Natal particularly, and look at the Eastern Cape or the Western Cape where there was absolutely no problem at all, you know, and there's a, there's a curious sense in which we are all the same. We are all conservative. We all have recognizable values. It might be the church that did it to us. I don't know. But, you know, we all, we all, have, fa we all have roughly the same sort of family values. We all want our kids to get educated um, and for them to do well and become doctors and lawyers and God knows what. Um, so there is a shared... There, is, there are things that we share. We just can't get over the hump. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it will take generations. We can't get over the hump that our history created. Um, and until we do, until we have leadership that makes that possible, um, we'll do everything a little bit more slowly than the rest of the world. And that's very, it's, it's, you say sad, it is a bit sad because it means we miss out on lots of opportunities. Yeah, and it's particularly bad time not to catch up with everyone else when things are changing so fast. It does seem like if we don't get our house in order quite quickly, that the, the gap can tend to grow rather than to shrink. And I think that, that is, that's probably the, the great but in a lot of the, the more sort of optimistic people have looked at the general trend of society going upwards and to the right, the great people like Hans Rosling and all the rest of it with factfulness and Steven Pinker and all those, all those thinkers that talk about how in general things are getting better for most of the world. However, when you start to look into those charts and you zoom into them, you realize that a lot of that growth has missed a lot of Southern Africa. It's, it's gone by us, right? And that and, and that some of those really key human development indicators are actually trending down right now and that there's no guarantee that we're going to have the nice up and to the right trajectory that some of the other developing catch-up markets like India and China and various parts of Asia have been able to capitalize on. And a lot of that is very unfair due to general global history, but as Terry Pratchett says, even if it's kind of not your fault, it is your responsibility to do something about it because the rest of the world, quite frankly, just doesn't care to, to help us along over this transition. It's going to be up to us to claw our place into history. I don't know if you agree with that, but... It is absolutely going to be up to us and we are on our own. And, and you know, what you, what, you, what you want here then is a... Is a and I don't... I don't want to put all of the onus on the government, but you know, you need a government that's relaxed and that knows itself and that is content, I suppose, um, with what it has. In other words, it doesn't need to do everything itself. You need a government that trusts its citizens enough to, to let them go um, and to try new things and to, um, you know, not, in other words, less government, you know, less regulation, go for it. You know, you think you can do X, have a go, let's see what happens. Um, because, because if you do that and it succeeds, you might, you know, job creation is a byproduct of, 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 of risk taking. And, um, uh, so, so absolutely, you know, um, I, I'm just trying to think of, of an, of, a, of an instance, um, to, to use as an illustration. When I was a kid, my dad was a building contractor in Amtata, um, and I clearly remember him 
not being able, I clearly remember him not being allowed uh, to, to, to bring in the car from East London to Amtata, two hour, a two hour drive, a bag of nails. Okay, the only way that you could legally transport a bag of nails from East London to Amtata was on the railways. You had to put it on the railways, no, no ifs or buts. Um, and of course the railways survived, you know, it was great. Um, and uh, there are people now who, you know, talk about doing the same thing to save Transnet now, but of course it's too late, the horse is bolted, trucks are all over the place. Um, but, but, you know, the, 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 the um, there's an impulse, there's an impulse in us um, to, to say no to everything rather than to say yes to everything. Uh, and it's why we don't, it's why we don't see more, it's why we're not an, a, more adventurous. Um, I don't know what it is that we could do, uh, you know, that we, that we aren't doing now because things, you know, I don't know what we need. Um, it would require somebody with a brighter than I am to invent something and I suddenly didn't realize I needed and want to buy immediately. So um we 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 um we have missed out as you say on lots of things and i'm sure we continue to miss out on lots of things the only way to be sure that we aren't missing out is for the somehow for the state to have the courage to step back they talk about it now in, in various ways less regulation um uh, ramaphosa has appointed sipon Corsi to go into his office to get rid of red tape and all that kind of thing. But it's a much more fundamental shift that's required. The government itself needs to understand that it can't do everything. And that we are light years away from. The ANC, you, I don't know if you watched this, the, the State of the Nation address. I unfortunately did. And, but it was worth, worth it simply for the stunned silence from the ANC MPs in the City Hall in Cape Town when he said that business was created jobs, not government. I mean, there was not, they just couldn't okay. compute it. What, you know, what? Um, and, uh, you know, and he said, believe it or not. Of course, a week later, he unraveled the thing and, you know, backpedaled like hell and, and this, you know, try to explain it away. But it is simply, you have to understand how deep the ideological, damage done by, um, by exile, particularly, uh, particularly in, the, in Eastern Europe and Russia, to the people who govern us now. They, they are at heart um, communists. I mean, they really, they, had, they admired the people that they were in exile with. They thought they were going to bring it back here. And they've never, ever gotten to the point where they understand that government can't do everything. In Russia, the government does do everything. Um, well, that's a, that's a pretty good point, right? So to sort of sum it up, it's like government's got to do less and say yes a bit more, right? So you've got, yeah. got to get a little bit more permission and do a bit less, which should actually be quite an easy sell if anyone in government is, is you watching. Would have thought so. You would have thought so. And what would be so interesting, you know, is watching black South Africans come out of their shell and innovate because there's so much energy in there, in that in in this group of people who are hidden from view largely because they don't have money and they don't have access to media and all that. But you know these are people capable of surviving on almost nothing. Imagine what 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 um, that creativity uh, and that resilience could exactly. do if it was, a, if it was imagine, unleashed. Imagine with, and the and the <laughs> strategies that get involved. We we don't even begin to understand what we're sitting with here in this country, but. You know, the government can't take the risk because politically it risks losing them. Uh, if it lets, you know, if it says, you know, go make your own way in the world. That's, a, so that's if, like the, the proverbs say, right? If you love it, you got to let it go and you might even end up strengthening, <laughs> strengthening your position. <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not sure that we can sell that to the government. But I think that, no, that point really does stand that, that letting go a bit of your hold can actually give you a better 
Always. deeper anchor into actually securing that future. Mm-hmm. And maybe that is a that is a message that could go get through to politicians at some point if they understood the, the bigger payoff further down the line, that by yeah. sort of hanging on too tightly to what you've got doesn't allow you to grab hold of what yeah. could be available to you. But um, we're going to have to wrap this up in, in a minute, but I do want to give you the, the last comment so that you're able to close off any thoughts you didn't get to say and if you could also tell people where to find you if they want to continue this conversation or to engage with you further after listening to this well thank you i mean i don't know that i've got anything you know dramatic or or um, uh, momentous to say um i I use i'm on twitter a lot at uh, at bruce ps uh, or bruce epps as uh, some of my friends tease me but here's the thing, um, we, we, we should not, and I hope I haven't been too negative about the country, we must, we need to manage our expectations in South Africa. Otherwise you're gonna get depressed and want to leave and want to be somewhere else and the grass is always gonna be greener. The expectation in South Africa needs to be, needs to be molded around what, um, uh, what is possible. What is possible here, and we're right on energy, particularly, we're right to say, to fight for more green more quickly, absolutely. More renewable, more quickly. There's no sound argument against it. There isn't, there just is not. And um, I know that you, this is something that you are uh, passionate about. Um, I've become, I'm becoming, the more I understand the challenges. And so, and we must understand the extent to which our energy conversation defines us. In Australia, energy politics is all about energy. The Labour Party is green and the Liberal Party is not. You know, the Liberal Party still wants, the government still wants to basically, you know, open new coal mines. It's quite extraordinary, uh, particularly in Queensland. So we need to understand the extent to which climate will define us as a society and our solutions will define us as a society. The, 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 the current discussion about gas and this alternative and that alternative is all self-interested. It's got nothing to do with the final equation. It's all about who can make a quick buck um, now and, and not about solving the great energy question of our future so that people can then get on with their lives and make their own decisions about what to grow and what to eat and where to do it. The, 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 you know, until we get to um, uh, the point where we accept a green energy future and, and, and not just talk about it and policy and all that, where it becomes the thing to do, where I can put, where I can sell um, uh, energy back into the grid rather than, as you say, you know, have, have the local council try and tax me for having a, a solar panel on my roof, then, we, then we're starting to talk and starting to talk about, then we become a different place. People who are even poor can have one, two, three, four panels on their roofs and make a bit of money out of it. What's not to like? It is, we have, there is so much possibility in this country set upon by not only the state, but also by big business, by the establishment. Nobody has, these people don't have, these people are already rich, are already powerful. So they've done, they've, you know, they've got a lot to lose. Ordinary South Africans able to put money on the table by doing very ordinary things like selling electricity that they generate on their roofs, be it a tin shack or, you know, Italian marble roof, doesn't really matter. What matters is the principle. And so if we get to the point where we have a society that, that is set a bit freer, um, uh, we, we become a serious threat or a serious proposition in the world. Wonderful. Got to take ourselves seriously because it's up to us to deal with this. There's no one, there's no white knight coming to save us. It's us. We've got to make a plan. We've got to make a plan together. And yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, being yeah. part of this. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and rate us on all your preferred podcast platforms. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing, please join our Substack community via the link in the comments below. And as always, we'd love to hear your suggestions for future guests and conversation topics.